yesterday, which I did not manage to finish, and then I have a few more slices uh, about this kind of computing stuff, what I told you already. And then I want to come to large scale structure formation and basically to some projects which we are running in Pakistan. So, why do we need parallel codes? Computational costs of large uh, cosmological simulations is very high. So, large cosmological simulations is this millennium one, for an example, of our Jubilee and Bolshoi, and multi dark simulations. And the last one is this one using the H. ACC of the hybrid acceleration cosmology code. So I don't know exactly how big it was, but it is an order of magnitude bigger than what <coughs> we could do before. And this uh, simulation ran typically a million of, of CPU hours. And if you are talking about million or many million of CPU hours, you need to do it earlier, otherwise you have to wait a, a lifetime or so. And these are some examples of this is taken from yeah, this is taken from the Bolshoi from the Millennium simulation. Just to give you an idea if you have a big simulation. You could do basically the same with our simulation, but I don't have these nice blocks so that is stolen from somebody. I don't remember from whom. Matthias probably Steinmetz. There's a big box and if you zoom in, you see more and more structures. So this is here. I don't know how well you can see it. I cannot see it at all. So it goes down to a few mega uh, parsecs, and uh, you have a big volume, and in this big volume you have resolved all these halos, so you can make uh, statistical studies, including the sub population. This is the main point why you need uh, big uh, computational boxes with high resolution. And there are different parallelization methods. OpenMP and MPI is the most what has been used in these codes in most cases together. In all cases at least which I know it has been used somehow together. OpenMP is an open multiple processing application. <coughs> so the idea is uh, that you have a shared memory somewhere and a few CPUs which see the same uh, shared memory and if you have an and kind of, um, um, if you have to do an operation many times in the loop, then you can uh, distribute this loop to different uh, CPUs and then you can run it n times faster if you have, if you distribute it to n, in principle n times faster if you distribute it to n CPUs. So this is relatively easy uh, to implement. So you have only a few compiler uh, directives, you have to <coughs> input a few routines and uh, you can use it in C and in uh, C++ and in Fortran. <coughs> so we used it, I personally used it in Fortran, but you can use it in other event types. So this is the simplest and most straightforward parallelization method, you just put a few lines in on top of a, a boom loop and that's it, and it goes faster, more or less. MPI is more uh, uh, complicated, so this is message, message passing the interface. You need again libraries and so on <coughs> to input it, but you need also to change uh, your code now. I mean, you need to tell the code uh, that uh, some parts of the code must be distributed to different uh, um, CPUs or to different nodes. These nodes can contain, uh, contain again a number of uh, cores, a number of CPUs. And, but in the code, you need to change already a lot and you need to think exactly what you, what you really want to do and how you can distribute it. Okay, this is clear. OpenMP needs a computer with shared and this works on distributed memory. I explained it already. So if you have open and P by hardware, it's more expensive because uh, typically the memory is more expensive than the CPU itself. So if you have an MP and MPI, you have very often, like in our institute, you have clusters with whatever I think you have 1,000 or so cores, which is not really expensive because each of these cores has only a relatively small memory. 
So the programming that I already explained also is inexpensive because you put just a few additional lines and then it works or it doesn't work. This is wrong. And uh, in MPI it is more expensive because you need to send information between the different uh, nodes which are working on uh, the uh, which are working with different uh, informations with different uh, informations of the storage system. So the migration is easy because you have only to add a few lines. It is more difficult because in the best case you start from scratch. So we did not start from scratch and we were running uh, after a few years of the problems. I explain it later. This is why the act you can write early uh, apply it and this depends a little bit on the problem what uh, you are looking for. But in general, if you are talking about big uh, problems, then you need to go to MPI because here you can do it with 8 or with 16 or whatever CPUs. I don't know whether it is reasonable to use more than 16. We never use more than 16. Here it is more difficult. So this is a kind of a cosmological and body simulations scaling over the years from 1970 to 2010. This is something like this line. So you have every, uh, it follows basically Moore's law uh, that you have every 16, 15, 16 months, what do we say here, 16, 17 months, whatever, and, and doubling uh, of the size of the simulation because you have a doubling of the, or you had over the last years a doubling of the speed of the computers and also of the size of the computers because you need to put all, the, all your uh, information about all particles into the memory. So this is again taken from somebody from the Millennium uh, people. This is the reason why you see here the Millennium man should have become possible in 2010 but we did it already in 2004. Mm -hmm. Zoomed initial conditions. So this is basically about big boxes in which you have every very same resolution. In parallel uh, to these big boxes, you are interested in running zoom simulations, something that we discussed in this after the talk two days ago or so. And in zoom simulation, the problem is you want to have very high resolution for a certain object. We started with, for example, with um, Void, a big void, we wanted to know how, what is the inner structure of the void. Other people want to know, we did it also for clusters, the inner structure of clusters, the inner structure of the galaxy or so. So in the zoom simulation, you try always uh, to find an object and uh, to simulate it then with much higher resolution. So the step is typically you run a low resolution cosmological simulation, you find an object of interest, a cluster, a galaxy, a void, or whatever you are interested in. When you re-simulate this region in high resolution, with high mass and force resolution both, of course, and keep the rest of the box in low resolution. So you have the right cosmological environment. This is different of that, what uh, we discussed two days ago in, in, uh, after the talk. And this is the way how you can get very high resolution in a certain region. And again, also this has to be done in parallel. So in the initial conditions for individual radios, I'm going to talk about this on Friday, if I finish my today lecture somehow early enough. But there are other, <coughs> I'm talking about what we are doing, but there are other projects like the Aquarius project, and this is, the idea is always the same, you find in a big simulation, an object of interest, in this case, uh, these are different galaxies, and when you run it or the Lactea, this is a cosmological, uh, this is in a cosmological box and very high resolution uh, simulation of a halo, dark matter halo only, there you can, I don't remember exactly how many, but probably more than a billion particles in this dark matter halo. You can see very nice the inner structure here. In, Normal density plot of 60 
this fixed density world. As I said, we did the same. We did it in this constraint uh, simulation uh, project. So this is in, on top of uh, zoom in. We put also initial theory, the initial conditions, information about the local universe, so that we can see, okay, this object looks like a Milky Way, and this looks like Andromeda, and this looks like M33 in a certain sense. I'm not sure that uh, Yehuda talked about this a little bit last week, about these constraints, but I just need to mention it a little bit. Okay. So the plan was uh, to talk about these kind of simulations on Friday. Let's see how far we go today. The last page. Since I started with Seldovich, I found this quote in German. Uh, and Kippenhahn said uh, that this is by Sertorich. So, so the translation of this is cosmologists are often in error but never in doubt. <laughs> this is something which is very important. Whenever you hear a talk, my talk, Yehuda's talk, or the talk of anybody else, remember this sentence. And when you see a proof of this statement is that Kippenhahn, who is a very famous cosmologist, for this sentence in German and said it is by Yankovic uh, yeah, and uh, Martin Rees, another famous cosmologist, for this sentence in the uh, English edition and said uh, this is by the Thunder. And last year I was in, in Moscow, I showed basically this book and said this is an example that, uh, that cosmologists are from time to time in error because one of both must be a terror. I mean, this one in Russia, John Russia, some young John Dartus, his chair said, No, 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 I know it exactly. It is not thunder. So, this is something, remember, for the rest of your career in cosmology, whenever somebody says something, it could be wrong. Okay. So, we are done with this part. Physically, you have this core, and sometimes you have a memory. 
for some of this course, the memory is directly uh, is directly combined with uh, the core, and for the others you need to ask, uh, and then if, it, if the distance is longer, uh, then it takes longer time. So in this uh, case, uh, you need already to think a little bit about what you are doing and how are you distributing this. So this is the simplest basically what you have already now. This is a bit of laptops. If you go in this direction, I remember I started uh, with uh, my first computer <coughs> in 1973 or 1974. That was approximately this, this size, plus, <laughs> plus this size. And it was with something, uh, it was a punch tape. Have you ever seen this? Do you know what it is? I, I, didn't, I didn't remember the word in English, so I had to look up in English and I looked up that it is Sinta Perforata. Do you know what a Sinta Perforata is? Now my first, so my, my first uh, program for my diploma thesis was this kind of Sinta Perforata, this size, approximately the length of this room. <laughs> and there was a program uh, uh, which uh, calculated uh, the, nuclear, the nuclear matter inside, the properties of nuclear matter inside the neutron star. And, and, and the story was, at some moment, I had to get the key of the room, and I went into his room and forced the person who is in this room to finish, because now it's my time, one hour or so. And then I took my simple, and it was very difficult if it was... You, you had to be very careful because the program you do once this and then the program is gone. So and then you put it into this computer and then it it reads in. And then it does something for you and at the end uh, it gives uh, I don't remember how it gave to the side. Probably printed also on, on, on something, whatever, I don't remember. What I remember is what I made tests. So I said the computer say calculate one plus one plus one plus one and so on. And then I stopped the time for one minute. And in one minute, uh, the computer went to 37,000, which is not really much. This is probably what your, if you do it on your cell phone, it uh, could be possible in one second how the, how the numbers work. So this is getting about getting a, an idea of this from when I was in your position and for my diploma thesis to until now, when I go to retire. And now you can think about what happens with you if you retire. And this is to give you a kind of an idea of that. Okay, so this is uh, a network of these computers. This is what we basically use for our big simulation. We have many nodes. I mean, if I do an analysis, an offensive analysis of one of the big simulations, which I'm going to show you later, I typically use 960 MPI uh, processes, and then each of these MPI processes to to cause so it's a huge number of nodes. And these nodes are sitting somewhere in the network. You have on the other side the storage system, you have the user, they need to communicate. And a lot of time is going, for example, from here in order to load all this stuff into the computer. This part is fast. I mean you try to find a computer and then it starts to run. So now we have two problems with this model in future. The systems are becoming more and more expensive. Uh, it's always interesting, I mean, if I, if, if I get computer time, this translates into money. And sometimes I tell my director, if you give me 10% of your money, what I got right now in computer time, it would be really great. It would be of the order of a few hundred thousand euros. You can do, <laughs> you can do a lot. With that. Unfortunately, he's not going to give me even one percent or whatever of this time. But it's, uh, it is expensive. The computer itself it is expensive. You need a big building. You need uh, at least twenty persons who are doing nothing else than working uh, with computer. You have a lot of power consumption, the technology and development. So this is one problem. And the other problem is you cannot. Uh, anymore expect to speed up uh, the processor you know, because of these problems that uh, you are limited by the network. You are basically limited by 
the uh, IBE team, if you speed up at the speed of a professor, uh, professor, <laughs> professor uh, and, uh, it's getting hotter and hotter and you need uh, more and more expensive uh, cooling systems and also uh, you need uh, at the same time to increase the uh, uh, speed of uh, communication and everything uh, together limits is, is limited with the technology. So if to get to give you an idea, this is about the last uh, 12 years. And the interesting point is besides the performance which you have here is how much energy you are going to use. So now you are at 17 kilowatt or 18 kilowatt and uh, if you continue in this direction you end up with machines which take 100 megawatt in one building that this machine is situated. You see it here, this is basically more slow, but you see that already starting in the about 10 years ago, the clock speed, uh, this is the speed and the calculation speed basically on the single uh, CPU, did not increase more because what I mentioned already, uh, the heating uh, is too high and uh, so it is very difficult to dissipate all of this um, heat which you have in your computer. And for example, one of the results is if I now run something in Munich in the supercomputer center, I'm forced uh, to tell the computer whether I want to be really fast or whether I want to be ecological. <laughs> and then it reduces a little bit uh, the speed of the computer and um, it reduces a little bit the speed of the computer and then the heat and uh, in this respect it is more ecological. Unfortunately, what they forgot to put, they put this uh, extra uh, question into the submission file. What they forgot is uh, to tell us if you reduce the speed, uh, you get more time. Because now it is so I can reduce the speed of the computing, uh, of the computer. When I use less energy, which is good for the country or for the environment or for whatever, but it's bad, bad for me because I have 15 million hours uh, and I want to do as much as possible in 15 million hours so I think hardly as I should reduce but, but you see it is a problem about the problem and people are thinking about it you cannot add more and more cores uh, because I mean this uh, expects uh, it depends again you would also have to increase the clock speed uh, and you have, uh, you are limited by, I mean, we discussed it already before, you are limited by the hardware, you are limited <coughs> by the speed uh, with which you can uh, ask um, the cache to get something out of the cache and all this <coughs> here. And uh, when uh, there is another, another problem, but, but this is a general problem, it has nothing to do now with the technology. I explained that these applications are not, are, are not all of our applications are not fully parallel, and this is, is what is called Hunter's law. So, if you have an application uh, which is 99.9% uh, .9 parallel, there's still 1.1% not parallel. And if you increase the number of cores more and more, this 1.1%, which is not parallel, translates into a huge uh, useless used time of the computer because 0.01% of whatever 10,000 or the largest that we are running, 60,000 cores is already a substantial number uh, of uh, cores uh, which are idling basically because in that moment for this short time you use in principle only one, one of these cores and all the other uh, 59,999 are idling. And this increases also the number, the time. So what I think here, in the new generation, you, we have more and more specialized architecture. This is already something what we see now in uh, many of these uh, computers. So you get on many of these computers, of the new computers, you get these, uh, these GPUs, these graphic uh, processor units, or this link architecture and uh, this AMD and service processing units. But I have no experience at all with that. We are using in the group already these uh, graphic processor units for some applications, 
but I have no idea uh, how it works. Because as I told you, when I started, we had these old machines with, with tapes and so on, and we had our problems, and we started with the code. I forgot the name of uh, this, and then we used uh, different other codes, uh, different other uh, methods to, to write codes, and, and at some moment, uh, came to Fortran and uh, parallel Fortran and the API. And then after that I said, I don't want to learn this new method, this is something for the next generation of astrophysicists. So learn about this, this was the main, uh, what I wanted to tell you with this few plots. If you want to stay in this business, learn modern codes, which means C or C++ plus the uh, corresponding extension for this uh, GPU and IC or EPU uh, programming. Has somebody of your experience already with that? Uh, yes, a little, and I can tell you, please don't use it. I will, use, I will say exactly the opposite. They are really, you can lose a lot of time, they are really difficult to program, and there is still a debate which is going to be the future. I will better let the other people let which is going to be the future. When they have a more or less de decent decision, we can move on. It's really difficult to program, especially with CUDA, that is the NVIDIA graphic processor unit. Uh, mm -hmm. CUDA is it's really horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, are, we are running millions of uh, 10 million of co-hours on the T10 machine in the US with uh, CUDA parts. And uh, this is done from our collaborations in, uh, in, uh, in France, basically in Strasbourg. And, I have no idea how it works, I can only research. Um, like five years ago, everybody said that CUDA was the future. That was, in every talk they say that, and now it's really difficult to hear that because people start to try to move and was, was, that was horrible. Many institutes actually buy computer, this, uh, graph, mm -hmm. uh, this cluster of GPU, and most of them they are not using because they don't have nobody that can, can use it properly. I know one institute at least which has this problem. Mm? I know at least one institute which has this problem. This is our institute. They have or they do not have? We have. We yeah. have GBO and we don't use it because yes. of these problems. But again, I mean, you cannot expect that in uh, 10 years from now you can do anything without something, maybe of this or maybe a new line will appear here. Yeah, but uh, my point is that this time we are not the only one who we, we are working with this. The company of video game, for example, they are development a lot. Actually, they create CUDA. So I will let that the people with money they pay for programmers that make a little better the environment. That one is we can move easily. We can spend money buying a cluster of GPU or people that spend money because this time is different like the last time. Now we are not the only one working with this problem. There's many other persons with subjects really different from us, but with the same problem. Yeah. The summary of this is, you need to think about it. We have one person who thought already about it. <laughs> and they run away, yes. Made <laughs> decision, follows a recommendation of somebody. I mean, I personally, I was uh, in 2000, I was at the position that I said, OpenMP is perfect uh, for everything what we are doing. I never, I never really go into MPI. And when I was sitting in, uh, on a longer stay in, um, in Mexico with Anatoly Flippi and uh, we were talking and talking and talking how, to can we, how can we run a um, huge number of clusters and we came up with the first idea of an MPI program and then we started to think and to learn what is MPI and we learned that MPI is not very well developed, was not very well developed in this time. It develops and develops. So my expectation is that these accelerators will develop in the future and it will be easier to use them. Most probably the specialists which are paid for it uh, will develop them. So these are a few reasons why these accelerators are more efficient than CPUs. The most one, the biggest one is that we are working on uh, lower frequencies. <coughs> But the uh, problem is that uh, we are not very much flexible. So again, this could be changed in, in the future. And another example uh, for uh, that uh, this could be changed in the future is OpenMP. Because OpenMP basically works 
on, on shared memory, but now you have also machines which are huge in MDI. We have distributed memory and in the background the program is running, which uh, works like you see uh, shared memory. So we have something of this in, in, in Munich. So we can use many, many, many uh, cores of this machine, uh, thousands or whatever, which are really distributed and inside the machine the program does some combination of, uh, or does something that we see at the end with 1000 CPU OSS, 1000 CPU sharing the same memory. So it, we can run and could run in principle on 1000 CPU OMMP. So this is summing up, single multi-core area. So this is what I made, and this is what you have to do over the next uh, whatever, however time, 40 years until your retirement. Or maybe there is another step in this direction. So this is the current status. This is, for example, on this Titan machine, but my French colleagues are doing the first full simulation I'm going to talk tomorrow a little bit about. Um, they are using these many CPUs and send from these different nodes some part of the work uh, to these graphic cards. Programming models. Do you want to run faster and cheaper? Okay, everybody says I want to run faster and cheaper. <coughs> then uh, you have to adapt your code to the hardware. This is the problem what we had uh, with, this, with our code adapted uh, to MPI. It's a lot of work, and if you do it now to the more modern machines, it's probably uh, not uh, not as well. And it is not only that you have to change your code; you have to learn this uh, new language, a new algorithm. This is that you said, which is. A difficult part, of course. Or you can wait for quantum, quantum computer. I have more faith in those. But <laughs> no, yeah, this is this is. I mean, if for quantum computers, I would expect you can tell about that um, uh, in twenty years to your students. Hopefully. Okay. This is basically what we have now. Again, this open uh, domain contracts and so on, and the CUDA, uh, which you don't like, or the OpenCL or OpenACC or OpenMP or OpenGL, whatever. Programming mode, which is handling this part, uh, which is connected to the CPU. At present, we have CUDA. This is what the only thing what yeah, we have, not me, but in our collaboration, uh, some experience and something of this. I don't know it. As I told, it was uh, taken from another talk uh, given a couple of months ago, just to give you an idea that this is not the only, maybe this is better, I don't know. The summary is this, you can read it, which is the easiest way I don't know to read it for you, and make your decision about the future.
now formation of large scale structure. Um, what you have seen over the last two days was also something new for me, extra for you. I had to learn uh, to work with this uh, PowerPoint. So you have seen my first PowerPoint presentation in my life because normally I'm using LaTeX and uh, do this LaTeX to PDF files. So this is the LaTeX. And the other, what I have shown you, was PowerPoint. It's a kind of interesting because many things can be done very easily, but it is quite problematic to write an equation, at least for me. Which is very easy in Power and in TDF Latic because when you go to a paper, copy and paste, you <laughs> <laughs> can see it here. And this is actually the reason why I preferred all the time uh, doing this PDF Latic. You cannot do so many funny things. Okay, formation of large scale structure. And again, uh, uh, like yesterday, no, the day before yesterday, I want to show you first a few photos and, and something. So on one uh, Tuesday, I told you something about my history, and today I'm going to tell you something about our history, the institute system. So our institute is in Potsdam, and uh, but it was uh, founded already in 1700. So this is a letter of the king of Prussia uh, saying that I give now the order to, fund, to found an institute which makes calendars. So the calendar uh, was a real problem in Europe because each country had a different one. And it was now I'm traveling from Germany to Bogota and I have seven hours. But in uh, this uh, time you had, uh, for example, in Russia, it was the 15th of March, and then you go to another country in a couple of days, by horse or whatever, or walking, and uh, you are walking a couple of days and arrive on the 1st of April or the 1st of February, but they were really different. different. And we were also not in accordance with, uh, with the sky because uh, of all these problems, you know that the year is not exactly 364 days and uh, there are correction in different countries in a different way. So this was the, the background and uh, so we said we need somebody who does it, who can do it, astronomers can do it, we get some money for them, we start to build a building and this was the foundation of the Berliner Sternwand and the Berlin Observatory. This was the first, oops, this was the first building. Um, in Berlin, and then uh, 120 years later, we got the, the Institute, which then got a new building, and uh, again in the city of Berlin, and at least related to this building, was a famous discovery, namely the discovery of Neptune by Johann Gottfried in September 23, 1846. This was a prediction of numerical. Uh, what do we say? And it's not cosmology, but numerical astrophysics. Because uh, this um, French astrophysicist, Brian de uh, measured uh, the deviations of the uh, orbit of Uranus. And he said, uh, there must be something. There must be something, and this something should be in this direction of the sky. And uh, please look at it. And he asked Cambridge or whatever, somebody in England and somebody in France, and they also Bullshit. This is calculation and I don't believe you. And then we asked somebody in Berlin and, uh, and there was also a, a nice story. The director of the institute became the letter but he had the birthday party in this day so he said to his assistant uh, Johann Gottfried Galle, do these observations tonight as do it if he wants it. So he went to the birthday party, he discovered uh, <laughs> the Neptune uh, and became famous for that, which means never ever go to a birthday party with something interesting to be done. So, Berliner Sternwarte. Okay, and then uh, 200 years later, in the beginning of the 19th and 20th century, it uh, became more and more bright in, in the world, you had more and more uh, light in the city, so it was not possible to. Uh, observe and the decision was to move to Potsdam. So this is why we got in Potsdam a Berlin Observatory. This was in, in 1930. This is a plot of uh, 1929. And uh, you see here still that it is in, in the middle of the park. And in fact, this is a part of a 
castle of Babelsberg. Babelsberg is a part of Potsdam. And uh, so the king said, okay, you can move. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you part of this park. Uh, and you can build your uh, observatory there. And uh, the institute sold the building in the center of Berlin and got enough money for, uh, to build all these buildings there in, in the park of Babelsberg. I mean, this is the same story. I have seen the same story later on in, uh, in China and Shanghai. Uh, the old Shanghai Observatory was somewhere in the middle of Shanghai. And they sold it and made it <laughs> for about 20 floors. Uh, building clear and we got uh, in this building a few floors and a lot of technique and we still had money after that. So it is always, if you have a big territory and you can change somehow, uh, this is one of the possibilities. So this is the situation in 1920, this is the situation now. So this is again the same building, what you have seen here. And uh, here you see another largest uh, dome of the institute, uh, which disappeared completely. You have something different now here. Uh, this was after 45, the Russians came and they took this uh, instrument and uh, took it to the Grim Island. And it's still on the Grim Island and we are still working with it. And for the next uh, 40 years it was just flat. And then after unification we got a lot of money from Brussels uh, to build a nice library with the dome again. So we have again a dome there. And to give you an impression, so this is Babelsberg, this is Berlin, and the wall was here around this lake, and then this is the famous bridge between east and west, where we changed the spies. I mean, I don't know whether you know the story, but there is now a new movie of who did, who did with Schindler's List? Spielberg. Spielberg. Yeah, Spielberg. So Spielberg uh, he's making a new movie about this exchange of spies between Soviet Union and the United States and this was always at this bridge. And they closed it and he managed to close this bridge. Uh, there was another movie uh, by Hitchcock, but then in, in this time there was still a wall here and uh, he could not get the bridge, so he took another one. But uh, Spielberg took the right one, closed the bridge and forced even the Chancellor of Germany to come there to watch this <laughs> setting. So this is the institute again, this is this new dome in which uh, now we have the uh, library, no instrument anymore, but it's a new building we got uh, in 2004 or so, and this building is, was under construction, this was a kind of an old temporary building for 20 years with a cosmology group sitting here. And this is the same, now this is ready, he moved already to the new building and to this one. Building this again in this bridge, Berlin, what's done on the left inside Babelsberg, the part of Babelsberg. And this is our Leibniz building, the one I'm sitting now inside. Uh, I like it very much, it's very good to work. And this is the institute I'm coming from, Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics Potsdam. It was formerly at PIP, the Astrophysics Institute of Potsdam. We changed the name because we became a member of the Leibniz Society. This is a part of the sky. You see stars here and you see a dot. You don't see it. But if you go uh, to this dot, and this dot is the position where a Galifant uh, video landed. So we, have mm -hmm. we have something clear in, in our letter. So, this is an European, uh, for Europeans, this is a quite old uh, uh, observatory, 200, uh, 300 and whatever, 14 years now. Not for you, because I saw now a much older uh, observatory, a solar kind of solar observatory. So the interesting is that the summer, so the sun will be seen from the columns rising above this like the lagoon of Igua, I pronounce it correctly. Okay. The first place of Muiska, which are people living here. So, if I right understand, it must be somewhere here, right? Because this is equinox, it points to this uh, point, and it, yeah. Uh, I learned also something very interesting from Veronica about the possibility to become pregnant in Colombia. So, you have to go there. 
you have to be a good team, you have to wait for this, this uh, Solstice sun, or for the Equinox <laughs> sun, I don't yeah. know for which one, for any of these one, then you have to be naked, <laughs> you have to be pointed uh, to the sun, and then the sun does it. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, did I, did I explain it correctly? Here, I didn't know that before, I, so if anyone can read <laughs> 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 all the information is here. <laughs> it was a very interesting information for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> observation. So, I mean, we know it from the Bible that there are some people like this. <laughs> anyway, it's never mind. Coming back. It never has to do with the mind. It's always something else. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the point. <laughs> we are not so important. Exactly. That's the point. <laughs> the most the important part is. Okay. <laughs> so, let's, let's go for, uh, for this. So I, I want to introduce in the introduction, I want to go again through a few uh, uh, some kind of general remarks. Then I want to uh, talk a little bit about the Jubilee project and then and I want to talk finally a little bit about our Bukidan project. <coughs> These are two uh, projects uh, related to dark scale structure. The introduction, uh, some of the uh, parts, or let's say, let's formulate. Uh, yeah, so we are on for the PowerPoint presentation. I have shown you, I have stolen uh, some parts from my introduction here. So I will skip a few of these slices uh, because you have seen it already. And so this is something that I have done before. So this is the reason why I'm going to repeat, repeat at some moment something about general introduction. Anyway. For example, this we have seen it many times, and I don't need to talk about uh, this again. Uh, this is the visible universe, last case structure. So basically, um, this is the QDF galaxy redshift survey. You see in this redshift survey galaxy clusters, galaxies, and in the galaxies we have, of course, our solar system. If we are talking about large scale structure, we are talking about basically about this. We are not looking pretty much into the details of uh, galaxy clusters and not at all into the details of galaxies. So if you are looking into the details of galaxies, this is more like small scale structure and uh, the point we are going to discuss tomorrow. And the closer you look, uh, the more you look into the past. It is also something which is very clear. An example is here, how we deep field. What you see everywhere here very nicely is is a uh, filamentary structure with knots in the filamentary structure and there you have the most massive objects. This is the same what you see basically in all the simulation. This is an, another plot, a similar plot, I think I've shown a similar plot um, on Tuesday. Basically the idea that we have the inflation and we have this uh, part of the uh, evolution of the universe where you have, uh, yeah, the form of the the variants out of um, clock or whatever early mixture. <coughs> and then you have some at the time where uh, the radiation becomes unimportant and uh, matter becomes important and some later you have the combination of any uh, and this is the part we are studying in theoretically. Again, this is only an explanation that uh, to go from these tiny initial fluctuations to what we observe today we need supercomputers. So what is the background? Again, I want to go very, very briefly through that, but show you a few of these nice photos. <coughs> so this is one of the most famous sentences, I think, in, uh, in, in physics. This is a sentence how uh, Einstein explained in German, and German was the language of science in this time, uh, that how to explain poverty. So he basically says, now we say that the field uh, equations of gravitation should be in this one. Yeah, on the left hand side is the Einstein tensor, on the right hand side is the matter tensor, and then we have covariant uh, equations of state. So he looked into this and realized uh, 
very quickly that uh, if he writes this equation for, uh, for cosmology, then uh, we are running into a problem. So this is again a very nice German sentence, which is not that easy to translate. Uh, so he says that this is a very complicated way and uh, I try to explain you how it works. And at the end, uh, I come uh, to the conclusion that we need this additional term. This conclusion, uh, conclusion was, at this time Einstein thought uh, that the universe is something stationary. So we saw this uh, universe and it looked like it doesn't change. And he realized that his own equations don't have stationary uh, solution. So goes as I or collapses. Uh, and this was the reason that he added this term. And later on, <coughs> it was not any more necessary because this other guy, Alexander Friedman, came and uh, found this solution. And again, uh, about Friedman, it's very interesting. He published again in German, this Russian, again in German, uh, he published uh, two papers. Uh, about the curvature of the uh, space, about space curvature. And uh, one he published with one end and the second one with two ends. And now there's still the discussion, some people are writing in like Friedman and some like Friedman. The German would be with two ends. It's the same like Hoffmann. Never have a white Hoffmann with two ends. It doesn't have a victory. <laughs> and then the next step was this guy, Edwin Hubble who said uh, something what is described theoretically is uh, what we observe in reality. We have an expanding universe, no need anymore for, uh, for a constant, for a constant, like constant. But after term, <coughs> this is something that you also know, of course, that uh, looking backwards is also uh, looking far as looking backwards. I have shown you this already. Uh, we discussed that uh, you can basically directly see the dark matter in these plots. Uh, you don't see it that directly in the rotation curves of galaxies and uh, in the R and S velocity of galaxies and clusters, but these are the very known early hints that there is something uh, which is called dark matter. The, the difference between this stage and that stage, when you were looking into the galaxies, people called the dark matter, but had in mind that this is bionic from dark matter. They said simply, this is, this is dark matter in the, in the direct sense of the world. When we were on this stage, uh, we say this is dark matter, but now we have already in mind that this is not bionic matter. And actually, the very first who said, used the term dark matter was already unknown in 1932. So he looked into the force and then a stellar system perpendicular to the galactic plane <coughs> and he realized uh, that from the result found for the decrease of his uh, luminosity he may derive an approximate value of the total density of matter in the neighborhood of the sun. And from this he calculates that there must be some dark matter left. There must be more than he can see uh, directly uh, in uh, in the, in the universe. And this is why I love to show this part of uh, this paper, because he says it is a pleasant duty to express my gratitude to the members of the computing staff of the observatory, especially to Mrs. Pels and Fries, who are responsible for the major part of the computation and work involved in the above investigations. So if you look back uh, to 1932, you had two guys sitting the whole day and doing calculations. I don't know which kind of machines they had, but we did by themselves the calculations. If I publish now a paper, I write at the end, it is a pleasant duty to express my gratitude to the supercomputer center in Munich or in Ulrich for giving me computer time to do my calculations. So this is a progress of 80 years in, in science. Halos of dark matter. Uh, this is stolen from the talk for the 60th birthday of Anatoly Putin. Uh, Can somebody of you read Russian? Does somebody talk to read Poroski? No, nobody. It says Serdi Anatoly. 
Sehr viel wie Sand, Sand and Atari. <laughs> and uh, this is a hero. Oops, this is oh yeah, and this is a hero. That's <laughs> 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 another hero. And if you talk to people outside of uh, cosmology, and this happens really to me. <laughs> Some people in uh, from uh, stellar physics ask me what the hell is a hill. <laughs> They had something in mind like that, or like light around our galaxies, and not the dark matter, either, either what everybody of us has in mind if I'm talking about a halo. So we are talking about a halo, which is a potential field with dark matter, and of course, baryons in most cases it is, is decoupled from cosmological expansion. It has a mean density, a superior density. And in most cases, this is clear, I understand, like this one. So what do we know about the dark matter? This is something we said also already on Tuesday. The main thing is we assume now that it is deeply interacting non baryonic matter. It's more or less cold. The question how cold the dark matter is influences the small scale structure, doesn't influence the large scale structure, so from that point of view, for the rest of the talk today, uh, we don't talk about warm or hot or whatever. Also, uh, dark matter, but assume that it is really cold. And uh, I've shown already this plot, and uh, that this is the reason that we believe in an accelerating force. <coughs> and with that, we can go to the next step and ask what do we know about the dark energy. And again, we talked about it. Is, it is the simplest ex explanation like that, but almost everybody in cosmological simulation uses now as a cosmological constant. It might be an unknown scalar field. Uh, it might be something completely different, like we have seen yesterday or you know, the day before yesterday in one of these uh, talks. Uh, and if it is something different, uh, we have to look for the cosmology for the observational consequences. And part of these big uh, simulations are done uh, to give some background for <coughs> So we have these equations we have already shown. The observations show that this is very nearby now to minus one. And as I try to explain in, in my comment uh, to this talk, this side uh, can be easily explained if some uh, physical model is if it is smaller than minus one, it's getting complicated. We need dark matter and we need dark energy. This is also, I think, I have basically the same text on one of these uh, blocks before. We have a background expansion according to general relativity. This is what we have concerned in terms of the power of equations. We know that this acceleration expansion starts about 7 giga years after Big Bang, pressure something less than 1. We have in all our simulations periodic boundary conditions. That means we can say about large scale structure only something on the scale, uh, say, quarter of a box. If you are on larger scales than a quarter of a box, uh, we are running because this will be influenced by the periodic boundary conditions. And uh, we are doing everything in co moving coordinates, not in physical coordinates, because otherwise I could not show your movies. So if I Click now on the left hand side, you see again the movie what you have seen already, so I click on the right hand side. So the left hand side is this movie what, we, what I have shown yesterday or the day before yesterday in the box how uh, filaments are evolved and uh, how clustering starts. If you look into an individual halo, it looks like this. You don't see anything, but you see shortly in the beginning this, uh, and you don't see it as it on my screen. Very bad, because you saw uh, a briefly discrete structure of the initial conditions. And then uh, you don't see anything because it doesn't work. Why doesn't it? Normally it stops by itself. Okay. Now it's runs, and then you see the first structures forming around redshift 10, and then you have one of these halos, and then you see that this halo evolves by merging with other halos. At some moment, a big uh, object is coming from the other side, 
Yeah, now it's coming. You see that in this moment also the shape of the halo completely changes. You see that this orbit is, was flying through uh, this halo <coughs> and uh, the direction, the original direction which was in this has changed to that direction. And well, now we are at shift one and we are done. And this is the basic uh, basic idea how these halos evolve in the large uh, simulation. And now uh, I explained to you yesterday briefly where this power spectrum comes from, why this k to the minus uh, k to the one here and k to the minus three on the other side. And there's a maximum which is defined by the time or the size of the universe the quality of matter and radiation. And then uh, you have um, you want to run simulation. This is a bunch of our simulations uh, with the corresponding size. So this is always the maximum of the, of the box size. And this is the nightest frequency, what I explained yesterday. So the length uh, depends on the number of particles, because the nightest frequency is max box size divided by number of particles per one direction divided by two. So this is the largest length, which means that you can expect the highest number of particles here. And in fact, here we have um, 6,000 cube particles. Here we have uh, 3,840 cube particles. And here we have, um, yeah, this is 2,000 cube particles, and maybe 1,000. And here we have uh, only 1, 2,000 cube particles. But we can extend it for these small boxes. We extend it uh, by doing pre simulation of a, of a certain region. And then you can extend it to 4,000 cube particles or even higher now. Anyway. So, what you see here is uh, if, you are, if you want to large scale structure, you need to have a very big volume. And then you can uh, calculate, for example, the properties uh, of the distribution of galaxy clusters or the distribution of galaxies or whatever. The typical size of the Milky Way is here. So in a, for a, only in relatively small simulations you have a Milky Way, you have perturbations of the size of the Milky Way today already in the, uh, already in the simulation by itself. In all these other simulations it evolves because the power is transported to smaller scales. And uh, you see in these big simulations, barely something like a Milky Way. And Milky Way is in this big simulation represented only by a couple of particles, a couple of minutes, a few dozen. And so depending on what you want to study, if you want to study this part or if you want to study a, 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 a formation the evolution of galaxies, in this part you need to make a decision about your box size. <coughs> It is clear in, in the big boxes you are never able, also in the future, also probably not with this, all of this acceleration, uh, what I have shown you, uh, will be not able uh, to get the details about the formation of dwarf galaxies. On the other side, if you are sitting in the smaller boxes, you, need, uh, you must know that you have only a tiny part of, uh, of the universe, so you are limited. This is what you said in your talk. Uh, you are limited. Uh, the influence of the box size and you can go away, you can go away <coughs> or you can enter this problem if you are running these kind of constraints and relations, which I'm going to talk quickly about tomorrow. So the computational problem is that we have a few hundred billion Milky Way type galaxies in our visible universe, mm -hmm. or the infinite number in the world. Uh, we have a few hundred billion stars, uh, we have uh, in the solar mass a number which I even cannot see in words, 10 to 55 dark matter particles. And on the other side, our uh, largest simulation, what we have now is 216 billion particles, the largest ever done is maybe in order. The last one is maybe in order. I think it's larger. I don't know exactly uh, the number. We have a problem that is very easy to handle, more or less easy uh, to handle the dark matter complement, uh, the variants which are observed uh, are much more problematic. 
the numerical challenges, how do you distribute this on thousands of cores, we discussed it briefly. This is how we solved it uh, in art. In this art code, uh, what, we, what, what I told you briefly, what we did uh, 15 years ago. So the idea was very simple, and this is the reason why it doesn't work. And it works, uh, uh, you, you can do it uh, relatively shortly. So the idea is you uh, divide this box into subboxes and you make uh, a simple geometry of these subboxes and uh, you give the computer or the code a decision about the volume of these subboxes depending on the number of particles. So you try to distribute the, the load of the work in, 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 all, um, in, in into all these uh, in different subboxes in a way. And then you run the art code basically in each of the subboxes for one time step independently. And after one time step, uh, all these subboxes or all these different MPI processes talk to each other and say, wow, I have so many particles moved to you and I get so many particles from you. You redistribute it, you redistribute these volumes and you do the next step. Simple algorithm because uh, you take a ready code, in this case, and put an envelope around this code and run it in MPI. The price you are paying is that uh, if, you, if it is very highly clustered, it becomes very inefficient. So this is something uh, which means one of, one of the things what I would recommend you for the future. Never ever try uh, <coughs> to take an old code and to move it to a new technology or to something else. It's better to write it from scratch. This is what Volker did for the spring unit. So he wrote this uh, gadget code and he had from the very beginning a different uh, uh, way of um, distributing the work to uh, the different MPI processes and I have shown this already. So he, in the gadget one it was very simple, more or less similar to what we are doing, but in gadget two and gadget three it become, became more and more uh, complicated, this distribution of workload. And uh, the result is that Gadget uh, works, Gadget free, what we are using now, works with uh, 4,000 cube particles, and we are not uh, able to do it with our own code, with the art code. Anatoly is now working in a new uh, version of art, which should handle also this huge number of particles. But this means something again, not taking the good old stuff that has been developed over many years, but starting again from scratch. If you have billions of particles, you need to find uh, your objects. Be, uh, or I do it uh, mainly with friends of friends. So what, what I do is I construct a minimum spanning tree uh, among all these particles. So this is the shortest line which you, uh, with which you can uh, combine all the particles. And if you have this minimum spanning tree, then you can say, okay, I cut it now uh, into, uh, into parts by allowing only lines of a certain length or smaller. And this cutting uh, means I find objects. So if I have a minimum spanning tree, it's very easy to cut it into many parts, uh, depending on uh, the length. This means if I have a minimum spanning tree, I can say, okay, I take this linking length or this linking length or this or this, and then I get more and more substructures out of this. You can do it with circular over densities. This means you have to run halos plus sub halos plus sub sub halos, and you have to take care of all these definitions how you can define sub halos and sub sub halos in the big simulation. And also a numerical challenge, besides running the simulation itself. So, Jubilee is a Europa Hubble volume uh, project. <coughs> it's an embodied simulation with 216 billion particles uh, performed at the Europa. Uh, computer, supercomputer, Jülich, uh, and where do we stand with this? This is very bad visible probably from, it's not the best plot that I have chosen here. So the Jubilee is sitting here, so we have here the box links, we are sitting at 6 gigaparsec because we were interested in a very large volume. We have here the number of particles uh, per cubic meter passing, which is basically the resolution. We have this line which is limited 
by the resolution, we have here the new multi-dark pranks or new multi-dark simulations. And gives you an idea about how some big ones. So it should be a sea of horizon is slightly uh, bigger with a little bit less resolution and say in this direction. And the new horizon has higher resolution. <coughs> so you are in this in this direction you are limited by the computer power. You can move upwards and backwards here by uh, adding, having basically the same number of particles but sitting in different boxes. And this is in conversion of the uh, different um, simulations. Just to give you an idea, this is centered at, uh, at the new plank. So we are sitting here with our new plank. And these are the old uh, simulations performed in Munich. In, uh, Millennium, the different millennium runs that share uh, the um, shape parameter of one and, and very high uh, normalization. So if you are analyzing uh, these millennium runs, you need to always take care that most probably uh, the universe looks like sitting here in the center. Uh, so you have a bunch of simulations sitting in the center with more nearby <coughs> with power and parameters chosen more nearby to that what we believe uh, to today what is um, today observed in the Earth. So this is a machine where we have uh, performed uh, the Jubilee simulation still much bigger than uh, this room here, a few of these rooms. And the size is uh, 6 gigaparsec and 6,000 cube particles. Uh, this is the number of meshes we have. The idea was to cover a large fraction of the universe. And the fraction we can cover is everything under redshift 1. And uh, we use the Coupe P3M uh, code. as a code developed uh, in the US and um, with an extension which uh, Ilya Ilyev has done. Uh, we used 8,000 nodes uh, of this Europa computer, so each of these nodes is uh, eight CPUs, so that we are using at the end 64,000 uh, nodes, that's a quite big, uh, quite big part of the computer. One snapshot has six terabytes of data, so it's something that you cannot uh, easily move from one side to the other side. It's even difficult to move it from uh, the disk uh, into the archive and back because we cannot keep all this, uh, all this stuff uh, in the archive. So what we are, what we are doing with that uh, is uh, the indicated Sachs-Wolf effect, <coughs> the cross-correlation between the integrated the sachs wolf and the large-scale structure. Halo finding has done with different methods, friends of friends, AHF, and we started at that shift 100. And if people are interested, if somebody is interested, it's there is a web page again, probably, I mean, if I cannot read it from here. Uh, but uh, if you search for a web page, uh, you will find, it should be somewhere here, I cannot read it. But I mean, I, I'm going to provide you, uh, again, a PDF file. So uh, if you go to this web page, uh, you can find, uh, you, you can download something, some catalogs or so, it's an interactive page and uh, database where you can get information if you want to work with the data from this project. Because this is one of the main ideas of all our plans we want to provide, we want to make it as much as possible public so that everybody can use it. So this gives you an idea about the resolution. We have a 6 gigaparsec box if we uh, zoom inside uh, to 1.5 gigaparsec, which is still big, or first to 200 megaparsec. I hope that you can at least hear your report. We don't see again uh, the structures uh, with this uh, projector. But you see that on a scale of 200 megaparsec, which is a tiny fraction of the whole box, we have plenty of structures. So this is a box which you can use, a simulation which you can use if you are interested in uh, really in, in statistics. 
what we did first is um, uh, a calculation of the mass function and a composition with Tinker. So with Tinker at all, this was a bunch of simulations we used before. Um, basically, the largest one, I think, was somewhere of the size, I don't remember exactly. He, he used our Bolshoi uh, simulation, which is 250 megaparsecond. Maybe the new, uh, already the new, uh, first of the multi with one megaparsec, but not bigger. And then if you calculate uh, the mass function, the mass function is something important, but uh, observers need from time to time. Uh, when, uh, <coughs> you do it by fitting uh, the mass function from different boxes, from the largest, from smaller ones, and so on, and then you end up with a kind of uh, final mass function. What we found in the big, uh, in this big volume is uh, that it's the <coughs> mass function that we have derived before from uh, smaller volumes of uh, the number of very massive clusters. So the Tinker fit. Uh, over predicts the number of clusters in the high mass end, which is important for people who are studying uh, extremely massive clusters. So this is the result of this first paper uh, discussing Jubilee simulation. When, uh, we, this is just an example of a kind of friends mass functions. You see that we go <coughs> to the zero uh, to a few times 10 to uh, 15 with the highest masses in Asian works. Uh, um, solar masses, so almost 10 to the 16 in, in solar masses. When one of the discussions uh, in the early some five years ago is, is extreme value statistics, so this is the question, uh, are the numbers, are the number of clusters, of very massive clusters in accordance uh, with lambda CDM or not? And from that what we see in this simulation, uh, it looks like it is in accordance. So this is basically this extreme value statistic taken from this uh, paper and all done with the uh, corresponding uh, cosmology of our paper, of our simulation. And this is what we are measuring uh, directly in the simulation. So this is one, uh, two and three sigma uh, <coughs> scatters and these, are, these points are the clusters we see, we would, uh, an observer would see who is sitting in the center of the box. You can do it again. With many others observe us in different places of the spots. When one of the interesting uh, questions is which kind, which Hubble parameter do you measure? If you, uh, if you go to, to the literature you see still there are some kind of a scatter of Hubble parameters. Now if we run uh, the simulation we tend to take the Planck value 67, 68 in this range. Uh, if I talk with Brent Tully, uh, and he is always standing there, and no, 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 this is completely wrong, it is something of the order of uh, 73, 74, maybe even 75, but he is measuring in a more local universe. There are many answers in between. And then uh, uh, the questions we ask ourselves is what would an observer uh, measure? which Hubble constant would an observer measure if he is sitting somewhere in our uh, simulation box and uh, doing a measurement simple of uh, Hubble constants by the observed, by the observed velocity, radial velocities <coughs> of these of objects of halos in the simulation box. So we put an observer randomly in one halo or randomly in space. If you put it randomly in the halo, you see these are again the one sigma, two sigma, three sigma scatters, and randomly in space these are the dotted the dashed lines. What you see is that an observer who is in, sitting in a random halo tends to measure a smaller uh, Hubble constant than the observed one, so this is normalized, uh, not than the observed ones. A smaller Hubble constant. And the real one, the real one in this case is the input of a constant of a, of a cosmological box. So in, uh, if you are sitting in a halo, you tend to be, you tend to sit in an over density, in a region of over 
density. If you are sitting in the region of over density on top of the expansion, you would have a kind of infall. So this is the reason why an observer who is sitting in a, uh, in a halo always tends to measure in the mean and have a constant which is smaller than the real one. And the effect is the larger, the smaller the volume is he uses uh, for the determination of the constant. If you are sitting in a random position in space, uh, then you basically measure a scatter, a random scatter in both directions. So the simulation box itself, itself is 6 gigaparsecs, so we are doing it until uh, 300 megaparsec over H. And you see that the effect decreases to a few percent if we are in a volume of 200 or larger megaparsecs. So this is not a big problem. Now, uh, if you put the observer in a random halo with a high mass or in a random halo with a low mass, you see again the same problem. The higher the mass is, the more you tend to be on the lower part <coughs> of the of its measurement of these measurements. So we are sitting in something like a 10 to the 12 or a few times 10 to the 12 solar mass local group and somewhere in space. So we have a scatter expected with a tendency uh, to measure maybe at a slightly lower than real uh, Hubble constant. The main point is goes quickly uh, to uh, an accuracy of a few percent. So the discrepancy between 67 and 75, which is almost 10 percent, cannot really explain with that. I could explain with uh, the global uh, constant which you get from this W map is a little bit higher, uh, is a little bit smaller than, than, than the local one, but yeah, expected in a larger scale. So then uh, the main reason to run this uh, simulation was uh, starting with <coughs> the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. So the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect is basically that what is sketched here. You have a photon of a cosmic microwave uh, background radiation which you observe uh, at should zero and if you are sitting in an uh, Einstein and Desita uh, universe and this program is falling inwards, uh, potential value of big cluster and it's going outwards. So it's emitted here with a surface temperature and then you observe it here with a surface temperature, but the temperature is not the temperature has changed due to the expansion of the universe. Uh, but the temperature is not changed with respect to another photon which passes uh, the cluster far away. If you are sitting in a lambda CDM uh, universe, then you would expect uh, that the following happens. You are again sending a photon into a cluster, but in the time when the photon goes through this cluster, uh, the expansion, accelerated expansion of the universe due to the lambda term um, deforms the potential well and uh, Photon gains less and uh, needs less energy uh, to leave uh, the uh, potential well again. When it got an infall, that means there is a uh, delta T, an additional temperature, which it gets in this cluster, which depends basically on, on, on this how long uh, how the potential has been changed in the time when it goes through this cluster. So if these photons come all, if you look for a number of photons which come all with the same energy uh, from here, and this is taken, stolen from the uh, Institute for Astrophysics in Hawaii. <coughs> we have all the same temperature and then we fall into this cluster and you see in the moment when we go into uh, the cluster we gain energy and becoming hotter. And the hottest here, and at the same time now the background uh, evolution of the universe forces this accelerated uh, evolution of the universe forces uh, the potential to change and if it comes out there's still some energy, energy and at the end I mean I see 
think you're much better. I mean, I'm not sure can you see that there is a gain of energy in this region. Is it possible to see also from your side? So this is the basic idea of the integrated uh, subscope effect. And now uh, the question is how to measure it. So we did it in the Jubilee simulation and measured this integrated saxophonic effect between uh, 0 and that should be 1.4 and this is basically what we got. So we put an observer uh, in the middle of the box and uh, this observer uh, observes the universe in all directions and uh, the assumption is that there comes a uh, temperature <coughs> that everything comes uh, with the same or is submitted with the same temperature and then due to the evolution of these potential wells in, uh, the, in the cosmological box you get some regions where there's less temperature and you get some regions where you have gain uh, temperature. So this is a full sky map of a predicted uh, secondary CMP anisotropy is to, due to this indicated sex wolf effect between in, in this range of edges. So you would not expect much more in earlier times because the potential levels are not so deep enough in earlier times. Now you want to correlate this uh, measurement. It, it doesn't say here uh, tell you anything uh, about uh, the, the place where this potential value from which you get uh, the uh, additional energy where this uh, deep potential value is in, on the path between redshift 1.4 and 0. So now you want uh, to get an idea about where it is and you want to correlate it with something, something else. And one of the ideas we had is uh, to try to find the correlation <coughs> between uh, this and the deep lensing. Uh, the signal which you get uh, from certain clusters uh, which are somewhere in between. The idea, the main idea of sequencing is that you have a random distribution <coughs> of uh, shapes of galaxies somewhere uh, in the original uh, galaxies. And if you watch these galaxies next to a massive galaxy cluster, the shape changes uh, due to a potential well of this cluster. So you measure basically the same uh, potential well as you measure with uh, the integrated sex wolf effect. And then you have these disturbed uh, shapes of galaxies. And you can measure these disturbed uh, shapes of galaxies. You, get an, you can measure an parameter, which gives you an idea uh, how these uh, distortion, uh, how big this distortion is <coughs> and if you have this parameter you can correlate it with the integrated sex effect and this is what has been done here in uh, order to get an idea whether this is what we, what we think to see in these simulations um, is correlated with or is really coming from uh, integrated that's all the thing. Now uh, everything is taken in a relatively small shell, relatively nearby shell. Uh, a number of uh, massive clusters are found. When you see the density field on uh, this side, this is something that you never see in, in, in the real universe. It indicated that all the effect in this shell, and you see as expected that uh, in the densest Parts, uh, you have the highest signal. And when you compare this uh, with the maps uh, which you get, the different maps which you get from, from the lensing, and again you can find that there is a signal in the same places uh, in these maps. Uh, <coughs> as well. okay. So from that point of view, we claim that there is a correlation between the integrated sex wolf effect and uh, the cleansing signal and in observations this can be used to identify uh, the place of uh, distance from which this integrated sex wolf effect 
comes. Now, another thing what we wanted to study in uh, these simulations are luminous red galaxies. When the main question is, what do we do? We have uh, billions of dark matter particles. Where are these uh, luminous red galaxies in the distribution of these billion of dark matter galaxies? How do we put galaxies into the dark matter areas? So, to give you an idea where yeah, the problem is, I'm showing you uh, the population density in 1994 on the Earth. So, now if uh, somebody, um, maybe an observer uh, from outside or whatever, would look on the Earth, uh, you wouldn't see this population density, but you would see something like that. So, you would see that there is a lot of light in some parts of this planet and nothing uh, in the other parts of this planet. So the first idea could be that this light is related to the population density. So if you go backwards, you see that there is a lot of people here and a lot of people here and a lot of people in, in this part and you see a lot of people, a lot of light here or in Europe or in the US. But you have other examples uh, in the middle of Africa, you have plenty of people but not much light. So this is this is something what we see also in uh, a problem what we have in, in the simulation. I think this is what you are working on. Uh, is we need models uh, to understand in which halos uh, we have to put galaxies. So we need uh, to describe it here. Again, the understanding would be okay uh, if we are in the US. We have a correlation in the Europe or in Japan, we have more or less like correlation between the population density and the light. And uh, if we are in uh, Africa, we have to correct somehow, uh, besides the <coughs> case that we are in the South Africa, or in uh, Cape Town, where we don't have to have correlate. This is a really, really difficult problem because what we, what we have in principle uh, is something like that in the simulations. We can measure the density, we can measure the number of halos, and we need to put light into that. So what we did, we used the halo application distribution model and have uh, selected some of these halos, uh, the just LRGs, and we have chosen by experimenting a um, relatively simple relationship between mass and luminosity, name, uh, namely uh, that the luminosity is proportional to the mass to a certain power alpha, and alpha has different values and different mass ranges. This is most probably the simplest uh, possible model, uh, but it worked and should be probably <coughs> improved. So in order to get an idea uh, that's how it works. We make a direct uh, comparison between uh, SDSS uh, LRGs and uh, the Jubilee mock. And this looks, I mean, this is basically the way how the mock has been cons uh, constructed by comparison with, uh, with observational data. And then uh, we can extend this mock at a higher redshift and hope that it uh, works more or less well. This is only a very small part, this part where yeah, we can uh, compare directly with observations and uh, then the extension goes to higher and higher. So assuming that our mock catalog is a good mock catalog, we can try uh, to study whether the <coughs> indicated sense effect is correlated with the large scale structure. Uh, so on the <coughs> left hand side we see uh, the mock catalog in uh, redshift and in distance. Basically, this is the mock catalog for a central observer. And this is the correlation uh, for different redshift beams uh, between the integrated sub signal and the LRG signal. And you can see that there is, in fact, uh, a certain correlation between the two of them. And okay, this is about integrated uh, solve effect and 
correlation with observed large-scale structure. When I come uh, to the multi-dark project, right, the multi-dark project is another uh, project uh, which we were running on a different uh, supercomputer in Munich. And here the idea was uh, to run a series of uh, very big uh, dark matter uh, simulations between something like 200 and 4,000 uh, megaparsecs, US megaparsecs between 2,000 and 4,000 cubic particles. In each of these simulations, we wanted uh, we wanted to study uh, the, uh, the properties of halos. We wanted to study uh, correlation functions. Uh, we wanted to study the properties of halos. We wanted uh, to use this simulation uh, to construct box catalogs for the uh, for the bus survey and. Uh, and again, it is open for everybody who is interested to do something else with it. And uh, to give you an idea, I like this movie very much. I hope you can see it. You can see something. So what, what we are doing in this movie is we are flying for the simulation box. We show uh, slice by slice the density distribution. So this is uh, where we are in the simulation box. And what you see is uh, these filaments which disappear in a moment because you are flying basically through, uh, through a filament. And then sometimes, in some cases, you see uh, that these uh, filaments are shown for a long time or are only moving uh, slightly in one direction. It means that we are not seeing really a filament as expected, but we see a kind of a sheet of a higher density matter when we are flying forward. And if this sheet, sheet is seen not directly perpendicular, but under a certain angle, then you would see a filament and then another filament and then another filament which moves slightly in space. So this is basically what we see in many, in many of these spaces. So we have filaments, they move a little bit and uh, it gives, it gives us an idea that the, the matter is not really only distributed in filaments how we expect from these, uh, uh, from these plots, from these 3D plots that we have. But they are slightly expected, uh, distributed also in sheets uh, on all these uh, different clusters. But uh, you see also in other points, uh, like here, this one, or in other one, you see a um, very bright point which stays on a certain uh, position for a long time. This again doesn't mean that this is, an, uh, uh, this, this is not a cluster of galaxies, but in this case, most probably you are flying along a filament, you have a filament which is uh, perpendicular uh, to this plane, and if you are flying through the simulation box, when you are uh, seeing this uh, filament basically uh, in, in, in different parts of this uh, the filament in the same position. So, <coughs> let me stop this here. And continue with the multi-dark project. So this is the first of these uh, simulations called for Shoy. Sir, um, we are really close to the next class already in time. I think we are already past like 15 minutes. Oh, I thought I have. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I, I, I looked all the time to it. In fact, oh, I'm very well in time today because I was. <laughs> <laughs> you should see it before. It was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> you are missing all the coffee. Really sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, that's the point, I don't like coffee. If we can we start tomorrow a little bit earlier, or we start a little bit, you can see. <laughs>